loving well and living generously. That is when Ocean Hills is at its best. Hey, before you sit down, I want to introduce you to the uh, Ethiopian greeting. Whenever you meet someone in Ethiopia, I love their greeting. It's just a, sh it's a shoulder bump. It's just this, man. They just do that. I love it. Everybody get up and do that with your neighbor. It's just like this, man. Just give them a shoulder bump. I love that. <laughs> there you go. I love it. <laughs> Don't make me laugh when I'm up here. Uh, it's good to be home. I got a little homesick, even though I wasn't even gone that, uh, that long. But thank you so much for your prayers. So many of you have been asking about uh, the trip, and I got a little slide there. Of course, some of you don't know, but Troy Hammond, who's part of our church, he's the CEO at Pension Mark. Uh, Troy and I went to uh, Ethiopia up to Mekele to teach a class up in their graduate school through our partnership with Bridges of Hope and Dennis Wadley, uh, teaching Ethiopian leaders who are on the uh, journey and on their way to becoming priests in the Orthodox Church there. And so we had a class for the week, and uh, we, we took them all out to lunch uh, our last day with them, and they were eating, I'm not kidding, some of the stuff is just crazy there. They would kill, they'd slaughter the calf that morning, and then they would just eat raw steak that was like this thick. I did not do that. I, I was like, there's no way I'm doing it. You know the other thing they do there that's crazy, maybe some of you do this, they, they mix their, their red wine with Coca-Cola. They mix it. They, they, they do that. I did try that. It was, it was not good. It was not good. I am not, I am not embracing uh, of that. But um, thank you again so much for your prayers. We, we taught this class called Leadership Principles. Um, I wish I could say this was like the most amazing trip of my life. It was really a hard trip, to be honest, physically for me. It was, man, I was sleeping on a box spring all week. They don't have, they didn't have any mattresses in the hotel. They just had box springs. So, and this was the nicest hotel in the city. And I'm telling you, I was, I was a trooper for the first three nights. I'm like, no biggie. And then I woke up on the third morning. I'm like, oh, my back is killing me. This is not right. And then, of course, the Ethiopian food was so great. But when you're having it every meal, every day, by about the fourth day, I'm like, Man, I just want some Honey Nut Cheerios right now. <laughs> so uh, one of the great highlights was the time that Troy and I spent. Uh, some of you, just some background. Our leadership team, when they approved the trip and said, yeah, we want to send you in, in as part of our partnership with Bridges. But they challenged me. They, they, they just said, you know what? Don't take some one of the guys that you're always going on trips with. Take somebody from our church that you haven't been somewhere with. And, uh, and so uh, Troy Hammond and I uh, had this experience together, and it was so rich. And so what, what a tremendous leader he is and uh, great thinker, problem solver. Uh, his insights into the scripture, right? And he's gone this weekend. Otherwise, I would have had him up here, dragged him up here to share. But I'll give you, I'll just give you one quick story, and then hopefully he'll be able to share uh, in the weeks coming up. But on day one of the class, we were teaching, it was eight to five, by the way. And uh, so I decided, I, you know, I'll be the lead teacher on day one, and he can interject and gave him some stuff. And I am telling you, I am pouring, we were really prepared, and I'm pouring my heart out. I am, I am using every tool in the toolbox to connect with these folks, to, to inspire them, to encourage them. I'm fired up, and I'm telling you, it's just like, I, I am not connecting. I'm using all my charm, my charisma, everything I feel like God's given me, and I'm like, I am not connecting. Has anybody ever had that experience, man? It is painful. It is so, so painful. And, uh, and then Troy had some sections, and that night, I, I said to him, I go, I don't know how you were feeling. Dude, I was drowning today. I, I just felt like a total, like it was a waste. And he said, I did too. Not that I felt that way about you. I felt that way about me. I felt like I couldn't connect either. And so here we both were, and we were praying, and then one of the students uh, from the class, he came up to us, and he, they call us professor. 
And, and with that, you know, Professor, Professor John, Professor Troy, uh, we really like the biblical teaching on leadership, but where is the PowerPoint? We want the PowerPoint. And I'm like, PowerPoint? Man, that's old school. That's what I'm thinking. No, we love PowerPoint. And so Troy... He's a total problem solver, man. He's got his whole presentation the next day. He was the lead teacher. He fires the whole day on PowerPoint. And they're like, this is the most amazing teaching we've ever heard. <laughs> so I said, Troy, can you throw my next day's lectures all on PowerPoint, please? And so God, through the Holy Spirit, used PowerPoint to save the day. But, you know, it's just a great example, though, of some of the challenges cross-culturally. And uh, I wish somebody would have said, bring the PowerPoint with you, man. I would have, I, I would have not been so, such a struggle day one. So let me pray for us, and uh, then we're going to open up the scriptures this morning. Father, thank you for experiences that allow us to be stretched and humbled and challenged. And thank you for new friendships that you allow us to develop and build and enjoy. I thank you this morning for uh, the ministry of Bridges of Hope in northern Ethiopia and partnership with the, the university, the seminary there, and these students that are so devoted, so passionate about you, God, so committed to becoming the leaders that you want them to be. Would you bless the school today? Would you bless these students? Would you provide for their needs today? Pray for Gurmay, pray for Tesfai as they lead the charge in this educational endeavor to raise up next generation leaders for their country. And thank you for the spiritual hunger in Ethiopia today. Thank you for the the, the real devotion that is so authentic and so real. And so we pray your blessing on these students. And we pray now for our time this morning as we open up the word that you'd speak to us, that you would touch us, that you would transform us. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for waking up this morning and being with us. We have uh, been looking at Elijah the prophet, his story kind of emerges in a surprising way in the book of 1 Kings. I'm hoping you brought a Bible with you this morning. If, if you didn't, we have some notes here in your program, so you can grab that on the back of your program. But uh, no shame, no, no hammer. But you know what? We, we, we are a church that studies the Bible each Sunday, and so we, we want to encourage you to bring your own Bible and take notes and circle words and underline them and write little notes in the, in the column. It's a great way to grow spiritually, to be interactive in the way that you're learning with the Bible. I know some people are like, wait, that's the holy book. You can't do that. Yes, you can. You can write in your Bible. You can underline. Don't cross out words, but underline them and circle them. <laughs> and, uh, and that's one of the great ways that we grow. So of course, we've been looking at how God is working in the life of Elijah. It has not been an easy journey for him. In fact, uh, his adventure has taken him to the brook at Cherith, right? And then on to uh, the widow at Zarephath. And thank you to Jono uh, for filling in the last two weeks. And I've just heard nothing but great things about his teaching. So I don't know if he's in here, but... It makes it nice for me to be able to sneak away like that and know that uh, he's not just pinch hitting, but uh, he's just doing a super job and what a gift uh, he is to our church. So today, um, as we look, we're actually, I made the mistake having a conversation with someone this week. I'm, I'm, I said I'm speaking on one of the most iconic passages in the Old Testament. Everybody's familiar with it. I mean, it's, it's been told and retold and overtold. And it's the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel and the contest between him and the Baals. And, and this person says, I am not familiar with that story. This person's a follower of Christ, right? And, I may, and so I don't want to say any guilt or shame like, maybe you haven't read this passage. It just reminded me that some of us, we need to be introduced to some of the main life-giving, life-changing stories that are found in the Old Testament. And this is 
one of them this morning, 1 Kings chapter 18. And true confession, I uh, spent Wednesday morning, so I, I got home on uh, Monday night and uh, wrestled through some jet lag and started studying on Tuesday and spent all Wednesday morning studying. And I had this great sermon on Elijah because we're studying about Elijah. But by, by Wednesday night, I went to bed and Thursday morning I woke up. And I have to tell you, I, I just had this kind of pit in my stomach that felt that this story isn't really about Elijah. This story is really about God. This story isn't about miracles. This story is about God and what God is really like, the real God. And so that's how I have titled this sermon. I actually, it was one of those on Thursday. I went, am I going to chuck the sermon I just spent 15 hours writing the last couple days and write another one? And I went, I guess I am. Because I really feel like the, the main point of this passage is about what is the God of the Old and New Testament really like, the real God. And so this morning we're going to look at that. That's the title of this message. I've called it, What is the Real God Really Like? And so if you have a Bible, why don't you open it to 1 Kings 18. At the risk of boring you, I hope I don't, I am going to read verses 17 through the end of the chapter. It's a, it's a dramatic story. It's a powerful story. But the reason I'm going to read it is because of the conversation that I had earlier this week is in realizing that some of you don't know the story. And so you got to know it. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, beginning at verse 17. Remember the background here. Elijah and King Ahab, they're enemies. God has raised up Elijah the prophet. He's spoken, called to uh, speak to Ahab and call the people of God, including the king and his wife Jezebel, back to God. They've drifted away. They're worshiping false gods. They're worshiping the Baal fertility god. Uh, they were, uh, they, they were, the, the, those that were worshiping false gods, they were abusing children, sacrificing children. There was uh, these, um, it, it was just a, a crazy life that they had drifted into that was very immoral and evil and abusive. And so God raises up the prophet Elijah to speak to the people of Israel and to speak to the leader, the king, Ahab, and to call them out of their sin. And so uh, I'm going to begin at verse 17 here as we begin. When Ahab saw Elijah, he exclaimed, So is it really you, the troublemaker of Israel? Now you can imagine even just that line. Elijah is called to speak a hard word to the king. He's fearful of his life. And when he sees the king, this is the king's first word to him. Oh, so it really is you, the troublemaker of Israel. The word troublemaker literally means snake. Ahab has just this venomous uh, outlook on, on who Elijah is. He hates him. He detests him. And he wants to have him killed. Verse 18, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. It's you. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you've refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now, summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. And then Elijah stood in front of them and said, and here's a huge, big line idea. You want to underline this. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver? Waver, waver. Can you identify with that line? So many of us in our faith journeys, we find ourselves on the fence in a place of wavering. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two loves, two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who's left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Now, bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose which one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar. 
but without setting fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. So there's this great contest, the battle of the gods. Is it going to be the, the Baal God or the Bible God? That's what we're about to find out. Verse 25, then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls, placed it on the altar, and then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no reply. There was no reply of any kind. And so they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. I wouldn't recommend that, but he does it. Elijah began mocking them. <laughs> Listen to this. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming or is relieving himself. <laughs> Whew, he's in their face. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted louder. And following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. All that pleading, praying, crying out to their God, Baal. No sound, no reply, no response. Verse 30. And then Elijah called to the people, come over here. And they all crowded around him as he, as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took the 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. And then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. And then he said, fill four large jars with water. Now remember, they're in a drought. Fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. And after they'd done this, he said, do it all over again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said. And the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering an evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed. And listen to his prayer. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground. And they cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. And so the people seized them all. And Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. Wow, what an ending to that story. And just again, the reminder of the messiness, the messiness of spiritual life, 
of God and what's in God's heart, right? We got this great story and then it kind of ends that way and you kind of go, oh my goodness, what do we do with that, right? I'm going to let you figure that one out. Now, <laughs> I'll just, I will tell you, because uh, I'm not going to talk on it, but I loved what, what Chuck Swindoll, who's uh, author, pastor, scholar, his comment on that last verse is that when there is cancer in the body, you got to cut it all out. And in the nation of Israel, and God was always, always, always calling his covenant people to himself. And in this particular uh, incident, and in this season of life that they were in, there was a cancer that had grown within his people, and he had to have them cut out to uh, preserve their integrity, to preserve the sense of family and devotion and commitment. But you know, when you read verses like that, I, this is w w what I love about it is when we think we've got God all figured out, then we read a verse like that and we go, oh man, maybe I don't have God all figured out. How does this work? And that, that keeps us humble and that keeps us reading and rereading scripture. I, I said to all the teachers this morning when we met, and I think this is an important piece just to share with all of you. My systematic theology professor in seminary 30 years ago, John Weborg, I'll, I'll never forget one of the things he said. He said, the root of all heresy the root of all heresy is to study Scripture by yourself. Now, what does that mean? What he, what, what he was saying as he went on to expand on it is, we always want to be studying Scripture in community. That's the healthiest place to do it, to wrestle together, to read a passage like this in small groups, to read a passage like this with your husband, with your wife, with your roommates, and... To hear a sermon after today or other pastors, you listen to a podcast, but then you wrestle with it together. You ask the hard questions. You, you, you enter into the conversation, not that we have it all figured out, but that's one of the great things about the Bible. Your insights, that's one of the great things about uh, Ethiopia for me. Some of Troy's insights when we would study scripture together, he had some insights I'd never heard before, and it was just so fresh for my own life. And so that's just kind of a, it has nothing to do with the sermon, but, but just a, a great application for you as the people of God to continue to read the Bible. If you're not reading it, I invite you to read it and get into a small group, but then read it together in community. All right, so what is the real God really like? I just have a few reflections here, and I'm already supposed to be done. Okay, so let's do this real quick. Um, I'm just going to share a few reflections uh, that, that came out to me. Number one, if you have an outline, he is the God who will not be two-timed. That's what, that's what I said. How many of you were two-timed in high school? It's like, it sucks to be two-timed. Now, how many of you two-timed your girlfriend or your boyfriend? Look at nobody's raising their hand. Okay, thank you for the honesty. That's right. <laughs> Come on, you guys. You know, if you were ever two-timed, it just breaks your heart. Nobody, and that's why I don't understand this TV show, The Bachelor, that everybody's, how does, how does somebody get to the end of that show and is ready to marry three different people? I, I just cannot get my head around that. Somebody, please help me understand that. That is what's happening in this passage. The people of God are wavering between different lovers. And God says, no. No, how long will you waver between the two? Joshua said, you know, you, you, you have to choose whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Jesus said it this way. You cannot serve two masters. You're going to hate one and love the other. And so we see here in this episode, what is God really like? God is not the God of pluralism. I know in our culture, it's like, oh, we're into smorgasbord spirituality. I want a little Buddhism. I want a little Judaism. I want a little Hinduism. I want some new age. I want a little Jesus. I want a little this and that, and I'm going to make up my own religion, my own religion. But you read the text. You read the stories of God. God does not want to be two-timed. He wants our full devotion. And so he calls his people away from an undivided heart to a fully devoted heart. Heart. And I don't have time to get into it this morning, but a great book that will go into counterfeit gods, worshiping false gods, Tim Keller's book. I've referenced it before. What is a false god? He says it's anything more important to you than God. 
Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. Do yourself a favor and grab that book. But the question I want to ask you is, as you sit here today, are you in a place of wavering? Are you all in? Are you half in? Are you kind of putting your toes in? Maybe God brought you here today because you've had a divided heart. You've been sitting on the fence of your faith. Faith doesn't work, just like marriage doesn't work. If I'm kind of in, hey, Natalie, I'm kind of in, but I got some other loves that I hope you don't mind. Does that work? No, that doesn't work. It doesn't work in marriage. It doesn't work in worshiping and serving and following God. God calls his people. He is a God who does not want to be two-timed. Second point is he's the God who speaks. If you look at verses 26 through 29, they called on Baal. There was no reply of any kind. So they shouted louder and louder and louder. No sound, no reply, no response. The good news of the God of the Bible, he speaks. He speaks through creation. He speaks through the scriptures. And ultimately, he speaks through his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1. If you're not familiar with that text, it's really a powerful text. But it simply says, long ago, God spoke. He spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. The God of the Bible is the God who continues to speak to us. And when you look at Elijah's life, God speaks to him. Remember, he speaks to him and tells him to go to Kareth. He speaks to him and tells him to go to Zarephath. He speaks to him through fire. He speaks to him through whispers. And Elijah heard him. What's interesting is the other leader, Ahab, the king of Israel, he did not hear God. He was worshiping a false god. He was willful. He was stubborn. He was rebellious. And my question to you is, if you're not hearing God speak to you through creation, through the scripture, through the person of Jesus Christ, through your conversations, your circumstances, what is it in your life that's blocking you? What are the barriers in your heart that are keeping you from hearing the voice of God in your life? I had a person say to me, a speaker I heard once say, if you're not hearing God speak, some of you are going, I want, I want God to speak to me in an audible voice. I loved what he said. If you want to hear God speak to you in an audible voice, open up your Bible and read it out loud. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that great? The God of the Bible is the God who responds. He speaks through whispers, through fire, through circumstances, but ultimately through his son, Jesus. Number three, what is the real God really like? Verses 36 and 37, he's the God who never gives up on us. He never gives up on his people. Notice Elijah's prayer. Answer me so that they, so that they will know what? That you have brought them back to yourself, so that they'll know that you've brought them back to yourself, even though they've two-timed God, even though they've betrayed him, even though they've been disloyal to him, he has not, and he does not ever give up on you or me. Even though they drifted far away from him, he wants to bring them back. What is the real God really like? He is a God of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. He is a God who is full of grace. He's full of forgiveness. You can always come home, no matter how far you have drifted away. You still belong to the family of God. He has not turned his back. And I, I, I know Jamie's here this morning. I just going to give you a shameless plug, Jamie. When I was in Ethiopia, I took your book with me, and uh, the last three words of chapter one were so great. You still belong. That was, those, are, those are my three favorite words of the whole book. Just 
Do yourself a favor and, and, and grab her book. Is it Rich, Hungry, Thirsty? Rich, Thirsty, Hungry? Uh, but it's just so creative and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I love it. Thank you for that. But those words, you still belong. You know what? We need to re be reminded of that because we think we don't belong. Because we've two-timed God. Because we've drifted away. Because we've made bad choices. Because we have not behaved the way that God wants us to. We think we don't belong. We think we've been cast out. We think God's ready to, 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 to put the hammer on us. So thank you for that great reminder. And I just wondered this morning, I think God's led some of you here today to bring you back to himself. And the question I want to ask you is, are you willing to come home to God today? You were brought here for a reason. Why did God bring you to church today? What was it he wanted you to experience, to hear this morning? You still belong. Elijah prayed that prayer, and I just love it. He says, answer me so that they will know. That's my prayer this morning, that you will know that God has brought you back to himself by bringing you to this place to hear the good news of his love and his forgiveness and his mercy. He is the God who never gives up on us. He is the God who does not want to be and will not be two-timed. He is the God who speaks. And then finally, verses 38 and 39, he's the God who's victorious over evil. What happens? The, the dramatic climax of the story, the fire of the Lord flashes down from heaven, burned everything up, the holiness of God, the purifying power of God, all the people fall face down and what? They acknowledge, they surrender, they go, you really are God. You just... That, that got real clear real fast through this contest because God shows up and the people fall face down and they say, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord. Now, just for one moment, back up. Think about the circumstances of what just happened. Elijah called for this contest between Yahweh and, and Baal. Yahweh meaning God, that's God's name. He's the one who sets the conditions. He gave every possible advantage to the prophets of Baal. He wanted no accusations that he had done something sinister to win. And then the narrator of this story tells us with delight, you know, kind of that he's relieving himself, that he's off on vacation. Where is your God, right? He mocks him. It's just, it's hilarious. But then in contrast through this contest, we see that God is faithful. God is powerful. God is victorious. He is a consuming fire. He is victorious. And let me just close with this. The good news of the gospel is not just that God won on Mount Carmel in this contest between the prophets of Baal, the false gods, and the real God, the God of Baal or the God of the Bible. The good news is this points to what happened on the cross, that our God is victorious through Christ, that it was in Jesus Christ that God defeated sin, that God defeated death, that God defeated evil. And that's the good news for us, that now we have access to this God. He's not far off. He wants to be known. He is speaking. He is a God who never gives up on us. And he's a God who wants our devotion and our loyalty. And so let me close in prayer. And let me ask you to reflect this morning. What have you heard? This story is not about Elijah. It's about God. God will always do whatever is necessary to reveal himself to human beings. And he always makes the first move towards us. He always initiates with grace, not judgment. And I just know in my heart that there are some of you who are beating yourself up because you have been wavering, you have drifted, you feel far from God this morning. But the good news is that nothing's impossible. Our God can overcome all the odds. And maybe, maybe that's you this morning. The fact that you're here is a miracle. In church on a Sunday morning. And if God is speaking to your heart, if God is touching you in that place, I want to invite you, I want to encourage you to simply say yes 
to the God of the Bible, the God who's real, the God who loves you no matter what. And so wherever you're at on your journey this morning, I invite you to to pray with me this prayer just in the quietness of your heart. God, we are prone to wander and we are prone to waver. Even those of us that are pastors and leaders, we're not perfect. We struggle. This is part of the messiness of our journey. And so we pray that you would forgive us for our lack of devotion. Forgive us for the times that we have turned our backs on you. Forgive us for the times this week we've betrayed you. But thank you for the good news that you do not and will not give up. Thank you that your grace, your your unmerited favor, that's what it is. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it, but it's here for us. We still belong. We still belong. We still belong. May that truth sink deeply into our hearts to the point that we are able to respond to you and to others by living a life of love. And so this day, fill us with your spirit. And thank you for reminding us that you continue to speak, that you are loving, that you never give up on us, and that you, you win. You win. And so we give you all the glory and all the praise in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Amen.